title is a bit uh, specific, but what I, I was so the way I, I, I thought it's better to to present what we have been doing is to is to really kind of throw you in a deep water and uh, and uh, more or less kind of present you some of the latest things which are really of the press uh, uh, that we are actually working currently. But as we go along, I, I will kind of spend some time in uh, some time on. Uh, on kind of giving you the context of what we have been doing. Okay, so first of all, as uh, I know, was mentioning, we're very grateful to 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 get the support of of CY and the SEC uh, in this financing. And this work, this agenda, is actually part of this research program. The specific paper I'm uh, the specific project I will be working where I'm going to be going in more detail today is joint work with uh, Jeremy Hang, a, a brilliant young colleague of mine in our Singapore campus. And Juni Lee, who was also previously in our Singapore campus, now he has moved to Fudan uh, in Shanghai. Okay, but actually, what we are trying to do is that we actually there's a group of research around estimating, uh, like, like the, the broad agenda that uh, we are trying to do is is really uh, bring some of the some some of the current uh, tools. Uh, from stats and um, simulation methods, in particular sequential Monte Carlo methods, I'm going to be certainly later talking about this later on, to uh, finance and economic applications. Okay, so we have essentially in this broader research group, we have people both from stats, uh, Nicolas Chopin from Crest, and uh, Arnaud Dusset from Oxford, and Pierre Jacob from Harvard, and Jeremy is actually a statistician, and we have a group of people at ESSEC and Tema who is more on the application sites and kind of the idea here is that uh, is that there is a two-way cross-pollination of, of you know trying to develop the methods but also bringing these methods to uh, to, to applied researchers okay so let me uh, go right into this and this this is really this is a kind of a generic frame of what we have been trying to do in the last two three years is that uh, in finance, in macro finance and uh, in macroeconomics, uh, there's a large class of models actually, which uh, you can think about as structured, relatively parsimonious, uh, probabilistic models, okay? Uh, in macro, this, they would go come under the heading of DSG models, okay? Dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Uh, essentially, I'm gonna be showing you one example, uh, kind of prototypical DSG model later on in the application parts of today's class. But essentially, you know, you make some assumptions on, on, uh, on the agents in the economy, consumptions and firms, and then you subject this toy world into uh, some aggregation constraints. And then at the end of the day, what you want to do, you want to actually bring this to the data. And uh, in the, the main framework, how actually the applied uh, macro that you have been moving to, is a, is a Bayesian paradigm, okay? And one of the reasons probably is that um, <clears throat> in macro, you typically have quarterly data, you may have 40, 50 years of data, so you have 100 and 200 data points, okay? Which means that, uh, that typically you have a finite samples and uh, quite often you also, the, the information in the data essentially is not enough and you, you also want to somehow, um, somehow integrate your prior information with the information in the data in a consistent integrated way, okay? And that's exactly what the Bayesian paradigm allows you to do, okay? So really now when you're looking into the empirical, uh, recent empirical literature on, uh, on, uh, on this DSG estimation, large part of the literature really essentially just takes the models and estimates them in a Bayesian way, the question of how, and that's what I'm going to be kind of spelling out a bit more, okay? Like why exactly where the literature is, where we think that the constraints on the literature are and how we think we can address these constraints, okay? But really what I would like to uh, uh, push here is that, that really these DSG models in macro are not only used in academia, but they're also quite often at least part of the, of the, um, of the modeling uh, tool sets used by policymakers in central banks, okay? For, for large central banks, they are one of the models they are using. The central banks has also reduced for models, but you actually have some uh, some smaller central banks who don't have the resources to maintain uh, parallel modeling tools. There are some models where the, the central models are actually these DSG models. And that's actually, 
really what they allow you to do, they allow uh, central banks to do disciplined what if exercises. Okay, so what would happen in the economy if the central bank would increase the interest rate by 2%, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they, they, they give, give them a kind of disciplined playground to think about, consistently think about the economy. Okay, now obviously to do that, you would want, like to have a playground which um, which fits with reality uh, as as far as possible. Okay, and I'm going to be coming at this point in, in in a couple of minutes of where I see that the current generation of models fall short, and uh, why I think that the methods that we are working on right now can help to uh, to address some of the of these uh, limitations. Okay, so that's one of the big application areas. The application I'm going to be talking today is really a DSU macro application. Okay, there's actually another um, side project that we are working on applications which are more finance oriented. They are essentially they're so called consumption based asset pricing models. So here, really, what you are trying to understand uh, the question is whether you can explain asset price movements uh, using uh, using macro, you know, using macro stories. Okay, so whether you can set up a macro narrative in a in an internally consistent ways that can make sense of the observed asset price movement. I'm not going to talk about this today, uh, given the limit of time. I prefer to, uh, to to stick with the DSG application, but I just want to kind of throw it at you that also we have kind of a stream of research on, in, in this second application, which is more specific to macro finance. Okay. So <clears throat> essentially where the literature is with uh, in, in both of these cases, so, you know, these models, I'm going to be kind of giving you the, like how you can think about them in general uh, in, a, in, a, in a econometric settings. Um, well, they can be very powerful. And, uh, but there is an issue is that actually, if you really want to have models which are rich enough to fit the observed data, and obviously, you know, if you go to a central bank and you just have a toy model that uh, doesn't fit the data at all, the data at all, then the central bankers will laugh at you. Okay, they will say, "Okay, I mean, how could I, you know, how could I have any confidence quantitatively in your counterfactual analysis if your model doesn't even fit the data?" Okay, so, so there is, given this this focus, we really need data uh, models which do an okay job in fitting the data, and uh, given the complexity of the necessary models which does this job, actually full-fledged likelihood estimation uh, of this model is not easy and that's really where we are coming in okay so we would like to kind of uh, build on the literature and extend address some of the limitation of the literature on how to do uh, full fledged likelihood based estimation full information estimation of these these um, these models uh, using numerical models. now in macro uh, the state of the art where most of the literature is essentially what they're doing about these models is that they imagine an economy around the steady state, okay? And then they really think locally around the steady state, okay? And then they, they, they really, the way how they solve these models is that they essentially do a first order Taylor expansion around the steady state, which is a so-called log linearization in macro. And they use this log linearized version, this first order Taylor version of the models uh, that um, to actually okay, so this is the really the model that they are solving. Okay, now the issue with I mean there are applications where this is fine. Okay, so whenever you you want to think about business cycles or or uh, essentially things which uh, which are which are not in the tails but which are which happen in normal times quite often. Okay, which are not too far from the steady state if you wish. Then the approximation error from that uh, may uh, may not be too large. The issue, and this is this is uh, really where kind of the literature has been moving in, in, in into in the last five six years, is that there are some phenomena, but essentially this organization introduces approximation errors that are just too large to forget. Okay, in particular, two or three of these uh, phenomena. Let me kind of throw at you some of the things that uh, where, where this log linearization and uh, this 
traditional way of, of uh, estimating uh, DSG models through log generalization uh, can lead to large uh, errors. For instance, think about uh, interest rates and the zero lower bound. Okay, so essentially what we saw after the financial crisis of 2007 and 8, we have seen that uh, inter the central banks decrease interest rates to around zero. And really what happened is that around zero, there is a kind of, if not a zero lower bound, but something called effective lower bound, there's a very, you know, it's very hard to keep decreasing rates, nominal rates to large negative values. Now, really what it, it means is that if you think about the policy function of the central bank, it, uh, it introduces a kink in this policy function around zero, okay? Now, if you think about this, when you, if you would like to log realize this policy function, essentially it will not work because you really, you, you, you want to kind of approximate the policy function, which is kinked with the linear function, obviously that, that just, that's just not going to work, okay? So that's one example where, where these log linearizations will not work. Another example where non-linearity non in general can be important is the effect of uh, stochastic volatility macro. Okay, in particular, the, the point that uh, that uncertainty in the economy can change through time. Okay, so there are periods when you know, first think about the COVID crisis or the big financial crisis or during crisis time in general, there is much more uncertainty in the in, in the economy. Uh, than in normal times, this kind of conditional uncertainty creates nonlinearities, which again cannot easily be taken care, taken into account with linear methods. And the third example where, where which where nonlinearity is first order is actually adding the financial sector into the the system. Okay, so one of the big working process in macro in the last ten years were adding adding uh, kind of financial accelerator effects into the economy. And essentially, quite often, these financial accelerator effects come in in nonlinear forms. These multipliers, you know, quite often they don't, don't count, but when these, these constraints hit, then they kick in. So they, they, really, they really come in once in a while, but when they hit, they come strongly, okay? So these are just some examples where traditional uh, log linearized DRG models may have problems, okay? Now, the second point, which is more technical, that, um, that actually it has been recognized that it's not only statistically that taking into account nonlinearity is important, but actually the resulting biases have econo important economic implications or policy recommendations, okay? So you can just kind of do, uh, give wrong advice if you, uh, if you uh, ignore this nonlinearity, okay? So, um, now there has been so, so essentially in this in, in, in this project what and we have been working actually on Monte on particle based sequential Monte Carlo methods for a while, but after two three years ago, also for me uh, in, in person most of my work was really in finance as I know was pointing out I was coming from financial econometrics. Essentially, what we have been doing we have been estimating uh, reduced form models right? okay where we have kind of assume some time series dynamics for uh, asset prices, perhaps uh, under the constraints of, uh, under, the, un under some no arbitrage constraints. And we were using these sequential Monte Carlo me methods to estimate uh, these models. So really the novelty of uh, what we are doing here is, uh, is that we are moving to a more structural dimension. We really try to kind of link finance back to macro, okay? So, in the, as, as, as you'll, you'll understand as we go along, and I'm, I'm always be pointing back to this general scheme that, that have these DSG models in mind, um, we'll see that whenever you want to do a likelihood based estimation, you can think about this in at two levels. First, that in, in a sense, there are two sorts of uncertainty if you, in, in this modeling framework, if you, if you accept the model, okay? First, there are some fixed parameters that are driving the, the dynamic processes, okay? So the, the, the task of conducting inference about these fixed parameters, I will call this parameter inference. The second point is that to do any kind of inference over the parameters, I need the likelihood given these parameters, okay? 
And as we'll see, lots of these models can essentially be written as state space models, nonlinear state space models, which where the likelihood is actually not, uh, not available in closed form. The second level, the second task to be solved econometrically is given the fixed parameters, we're gonna need an efficient likelihood estimator, okay? We see that if you have an efficient likelihood estimator, then we can actually show it to some kind of uh, Bayesian routines to do the parameter inference. So really, what what we are doing in this uh, in, in this in this paper is that we actually have innovation for both of those points. First, we go, we're going to develop a, a very efficient likelihood based estimator based on the latest. Uh, sequential Monte Carlo methods. And I mean, the particular method we are developing here will be called annealed controlled sequential Monte Carlo. And you, it's a bit long, but you'll understand in, the se in a bit uh, what I mean by there. And, um, and second, we're gonna see how to kind of, so this, this annealed controlled sequential Monte Carlo is a method that given the fixed driving parameters of the model, how do I estimate the likelihood? And then the second hierarchy is that Okay, then how could I actually estimate those parameters using this inside loop estimator? Okay, and that's where we actually we're going to have in the outer loop we're going to have this kind of sequential Mont another sequential Monte Carlo method running, and the overall scheme is called sequential Monte Carlo squared. Okay, and essentially what you get is that you get a, a total estimation suit, if you wish, which is relatively black box that allows you to estimate nonlinear state space. All right, so let me uh, let me kind of point out some notation such that uh, that you can you know, uh, see how these models uh, look like uh, statistically, and then I, I would like to comment a bit on uh, on how uh, on how these uh, you know on what we add to the literature or when a research program is entering in both of these counts. Okay. So most of these models actually can be written um, as a state space model. So, you know, just to, I'm sure most of you know what is a state space model, but let me remind you what it is. So uh, let's assume that you have observation times, small t goes from one to big T, where uh, ST is a vector of latent uh, state variables, okay? Um, and uh, here the idea is really that your system is Markov in ST, so, you know, all you need to know to go forward or backward is ST. So, you know, the state of the system is encoded by ST. And then you have some observations, some noisy observation on this ST at each time yt. You know, in a macro example, ST, for instance, the latent states could be productivity and, and <clears throat> demand or uh, some other kind of unobserved uh, structural factors of the economy and observables would be some of the macro time series like GDP or inflation. Okay, so we will see that later. In finance, these ST could be, uh, you know, these ST could be, for instance, uh, latent uh, yield curve factors and observables could be bond prices. And you can go on, on, on and on. Okay, so lots of financial and ecological can be written this way. Okay, now as typical in let me also point out actually that these methods, the, these uh, state space system is more general than macro and finance. Here we are mainly uh, involved with estimation, estimating uh, macro models, but actually Jeremy is using very similar methods in epidemiology, okay? So that's another, in epidemiology, ST could be kind of the number of people invest, uh, infected in, the, in a given area, okay? So actually this kind of state space framework have lots of different um, applications. Now, in any state space system, you, you have two uh, components. You have the so-called state equation, okay? So here, the state of the system tomorrow will, will depend on the state of the system today uh, through, uh, and, and some innovation, uh, the transition noise, and uh, the functional link between ST and ST minus one is allowed to be nonlinear, okay? And in general, epsilon t could be non-Gaussian nonlinear, okay? And the uh, yt, the observations are linked to the, and they should be, this can be st or st minus one. In general, let's, let's allow it. In, in, in a classical state space framework, this could only depend on the st, but here also 
let, let us allow it to depend on ST minus one plus some observation noise. Okay. I can also write that as uh, essentially, so in general, ST evolves according to a Markov chain, which can uh, be discrete or continuous valued. And uh, you have yt given ST minus one ST uh, that is uh, independently distributed according to some density g theta. Okay, so f theta is the transition density, g theta is the observation density. Okay. Now, uh, given such a generally nonlinear non Gaussian state space system, so as, as, I, as I was telling you, you know, the econometric task comes in two levels. Okay. The first level is to, um, the first level is to, um, the first level is to essentially, I need some, some access to the likelihood function. So given an observation sequence y1 to the t, the likelihood function of, uh, uh, of uh, likelihood function, the pro which is the density of the observed observation given the fixed unknown parameters, you can write it simply as an integral. And really, the point here is that quite often, if you look at this integral, this is actually a very high dimensional integral or a very high dimensional sp sp space. Okay, and really the question simulation question or the math question, if you wish, is how do I approximate this integral really? Okay, you know, and the point is that given that this T can be hundreds or thousands in finance, so in macro it can be hundreds, in finance it can be easily thousands or 10,000, okay? So clearly you cannot use uh, traditional um, integration methods, okay? Quadrature or stuff like that, because you have a curse of dimensionality. So you need to use some kind of uh, simulation method. Okay, and what we are going to do, what we are actually doing in this research program is we are essentially going to, we are, we are kind of developing advanced simulation methods to, to solve this integral. Okay, and um, what you really want to have is uh, the estimation of the latent states given the parameters is the so called smoothing distribution, which is simply the total density of the path of the latent states given the observables, okay? That's what you would like to have. So the question now, how do we approximate these two? Okay. Now, what you're gonna see actually that in, uh, in, in macro application, and this is where annealing is coming in, quite often, some actually, actually some of these observations can be very influential, so it makes sense to anneal, okay? So we're going to introduce um, an annealing parameter, tempering parameter lambda, okay? Where lambda is will be evolving between zero and one. When lambda is in is zero, so you can see that when lambda is one, you're getting back to the joint density of the transitions and the observations. When lambda is equal to zero, this disappears and you get back just the transition density. So. What's going on is that when lambda is equal to zero, you just have a target, which is just a transition density from which it's easy to simulate. And essentially what we are trying to do, we're gonna be kind of working our way up from lambda to, to zero to higher levels of lambda, okay? So I'm gonna denote the corresponding annealed likelihood and smoothing distributions as PY1T given theta lambda and the smoothing distribution as p ds zero t y one t theta lambda. Okay. So this idea of using tempering, essentially, what we're going to do, you know, really, you know, what, what tempering allows you to do, in a sense, it allows you gradually add the information in the observation to the likelihood, and it allows you to uh, to kind of in a smooth fashion, essentially, simulate points. So it really allows you a gradual approximation of your target, okay? Now, well, obviously this is not a new idea. So in, uh, within the state space models, uh, there are some recent papers by Svensson et al. and Herbst and uh, implemented this. 
uh, but not using SMC and not using control SMC that we are using. Okay. Um, and um, so doing this now. Uh, okay. Um, so the point is that this likelihood actually, so, so the point is that this kind of likelihood, this integration essentially uh, in most models cannot be solved in closed form. And coming back to this log linearization, when you look at this kind of integral, uh, you know, one of the reasons why most of the existing techniques in macro and actually they're using Gaussian models and linearized Gaussian models is because in linear Gaussian, linearized Gaussian models, what you have is that in linearized, linearized Gaussian models, here, epsilon is, lin is, is Gaussian, and here this is a linear or affine function. So overall, you have essentially a kind of linear Gaussian transition equation, and then in the observation equation is also linear and Gaussian. Okay, and then in that case, essentially when you are tracking the the state space, you, you you can do everything analytically because you really you are staying within the Gaussian family. So you can solve all the integral in closed form. That's really so. In most of the existing literature, this is available in closed form, so you can directly do your inference over, over the likelihood. Okay. Now, once you're allowing nonlinearities, this blows up. Okay. And uh, so, for most of our models, if you really want to uh, take into account nonlinearity, you you need to uh, move to uh, Monte Carlo methods and the specific, you know. When you think about Monte Carlo methods in uh, in econ and finance to solve these high dimensional models, essentially, you know, there was a previous. The first methods which came in were um, were uh, Monte MCMC methods, Monte Carlo Markov chain methods. Now, what happens is that uh, most existing MCMC. So, in in our current context, uh, quite often the MCMC is a bit hard to uh, implement. Because the typical Gibbs type MCMC methods uh, don't mix well, essentially. That's, they have mixing problems okay? because there are very strong uh, dependencies in these models. And also, you don't have uh, the required conjugate structures that you need for efficient MCMC methods. So instead of MCMC, we go to a newer generation of methods, which is a kind of, which is called Sankfresh Monte Carlo or particle filters. Okay. So, here I'm going to be going a bit fast because actually particle filters have been around for 20 years by now. But really, what you're doing in particle filters is that you uh, you kind of keep you you are uh, these particle filters uh, simulate a set of endpoints, okay? But you're simulating these uh, set of endpoints through time from one to time big T, and you are using uh, importance resam resampling uh, importance sampling with resampling essentially to stimulate the filtering distribution in this state space system. Okay, so in the general state space system, the filtering density is an infinite dimensional object. So you cannot, uh, don't know this analytically, but we are, you actually these particle filters are using simulation to, uh, to track the filtering density, okay? So uh, for our purposes, really what is important is that these particle filters allow you um, so if you have some kind of uh, proposal density, Q S zero to the T, which has a rec recursive form, these particle filters um, give you an estimate, an unbiased estimate of the likelihood function um, with weight functions like this. Okay. Now it is very clear by now. So, so the kind of traditional way of doing particle filtering and the easy way is the so-called uh, bootstrap particle filter. Okay. So because it's now by now it's very uh, it's very clear that to have a, to make this practical actually even though uh, any particle filter more essentially gives you an unbiased estimate of the likelihood how large is the noise in this likelihood estimate is critical to decide whether actually the resulting algorithm is operational or not okay and how large the noise is is obviously hinges on the choice of your proposal density, okay? Now, the easiest and first choice for the proposal density essentially corresponded to simply having the proposal density equal to the transition law, 
of the state space system. Okay, but you, you, you pick this proposal as simply the transition. This is very easy to implement because typically you can simulate from the system. But the problem with the, and this has been recognized uh, quite early, is that whenever the, info, the observations in your system are, are informative on your latent state, essentially using this bootstrap filter creates huge noise. It's very noisy, okay? So you would need in practically large number of simulated points to get the estimation noise in the likelihood down to a manageable level. And the intuition for that obviously is that here, whenever you are using a proposal which is simply using the forward dynamics of the system, you're not taking into account the information in the, in the observations, okay? So then there's a pretty large literature in, uh, in Sequential Monte Carlo on how to locally, how to kind of come up with a better approximation to the proposal using local information in time, okay? And uh, the so-called locally optimal proposal is that you are not only conditioning on the past of the system, but you're also conditioning on the, on the information at time t, okay? Now, you can approximate this, but it's still not the optimal one. Because what you would really like to do, the optimal proposal is actually, you would like to draw sequentially, you would actually like optimally to draw from the smoothing density. So you would like to, you know, essentially, you would like to condition on all the information up to the end of your sample, okay? And that's really what we are hinting here, okay? So here, instead of having this kind of locally optimal proposal, we're gonna be kind of turning, applying some, uh, building on some recent um, uh, papers, which are essentially trying to approximate the globally optimal proposal. So instead of, so while here you are trying to approximate the local, uh, filtering density, which only takes a time small t, you're only taking into account the information that arrived up to time small t. The globally optimal proposal will actually look forward, okay? It also, it, also, it is trying to approximate the, 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 the smoothing density, which takes into account the future influence, okay? And really what we do in this sense, we're gonna, we're gonna be kind of extending, um, uh, this is called court control SMC. I'm going to explain this a bit in a sec. Uh, that it just came out in and as of stats. Uh, this this was essentially the PhD thesis of Jeremy, okay, of my quarter. So here, what we are really doing is that we have, uh, I mean, kind of the background story is that uh, when we have tried to uh, to just apply the original control SMC methodology to these uh, economics and finance models, we realized that they don't work, and we really had to kind of Really, what 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 I'm going to be kind of talking about here is to show you how we had to 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 refine and develop a bit methodology to make them applicable in our in econ and finance context. Okay. All right. Uh, so what is this control SMC? So control SMC in general, essentially, here. Um, the key idea is that uh, that you are uh, you would like to uh, approximate the smoothing distribution. So again, here the idea is that uh, given some proposal density Q, the pointing out is that <clears throat> you can define some functionals where you are essentially they're calling it twisting. Okay, so in a sense, you would like to kind of twist the system such that you take into account the information in the future. And what you can show is that uh, if you are defining a class of twisting functional phi t, then the optimal twisting functionals phi uh, essentially uh, they satisfied some backward recursions. Okay, really, what's going on? The the easy way to understand this backward recursion for the optimal twisting densities is um, is that you are, you know, you really need to kind of take the future into account. Essentially, these functional recursions simply are propagating the, you know, while you are simulating forward your, your uh, system, the way you are simulating forward, you also want to take the information on the future 
into account. And this backward, so you have kind of things going forward in the simulation, but you have information running backwards to, to do this uh, simulation in a globally optimal way. So that's really the backward path that, um, that you are uh, taking uh, into account. Okay. Um, so essentially, I think I'll have to speed up a bit. So, uh, so what, what did I, what, what essentially control SMC does is that you define these optimal recursions, but obviously if you look at these optimal recursions, it turns out that it doesn't help too much because this essentially you have a dynamic programming problem, which is, which is still uh, not easy to solve because you know, here you are thinking about dynamic programming in, in, the in high dimensional continuous state spaces. But you can actually approximate these uh, recursions backwards. Um, um, yeah. So the question is. So, so in practice, what you will do is that you will essentially uh, approximate this backwards recursion, and you hope that the way you approximate it will be close enough to the optimal. What it depends on, it depends on two things. So first, what is the function class by which you are kind of approximating this backward recursion? And second is that given the function class, what is the Monte Carlo noise that you commit? Okay, because I'm gonna, in this backward recursion, we do approximate dynamic programming, but we are going to kind of implement this backward recursion on a set of simulated points. So you have these two levers of how rich the model class is and uh, how good the set of points is on which you simulate. Okay, and I'm gonna be kind of dwelling a bit on these two points. Um, so essentially whenever you're, you're twisting your original SMC with, the, with, with, the, with the, this specific phi that you're essentially taking the future into account in an approximate way, it's called control SMC while traditional SMC is uncontrolled SMC. Okay. And again, how efficient this is, it ultimately depends on how well the chosen policy approximates the optimal policy. Okay. Now, in the optimal sense, you know, if you can exactly really satisfy this backward recursion, you can actually come up with a zero variance likelihood estimator. Really, what's going on? Then you've been able to globally approximate the smoothing density, which is the which is really what you would like to have, okay? And how do you do that? Um, and okay, a, a second point, but I think, a second point that Jeremy does, and which is actually, will be very important for our purposes, is that that actually you can do this recursion in a, in a sequential way, okay? So if you already have, if you already have a policy phi, then you can see that uh, you can kind of refine uh, that policy through these recursions. Okay, so you, you can go in small bits. Okay. And um, the practical way of doing this uh, backward recursion is that you're assuming that you have a simulated set of points, and then essentially you are just uh, doing a kind of least square approximation of uh, in log space of uh, of uh, those recursions. Now, okay, so what is new? So, I mean, this is not new. I mean, the control SMC, this is already kind of, this, this is something which exists. So what we are really adding is, uh, is uh, we have realized again that what Jeremy did in his analysis of test paper is that he actually proposed a way to do this almost optimal global proposal for a lambda equal to one. But we have realized that actually for most models that we are interested in macro and finance, it just doesn't work, it blows up. Essentially, the intuition is that, um, that you know, if, if you begin to, uh, if, you, if you do a forward simulation without taking into account the observations, and then you use this set of points to try to approximate the backward recursion, the place where you approximate is really a bad place. It's very far from where you would like to be, okay? And that's really where tampering is coming in. Okay, so, um, okay, let me, uh, so really here the idea is that we're gonna be kind of iterating and um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip some details, but really the idea here is that um, 
what we do compared to uh, the basic controlled SMC, we are essentially going to be kind of iterating between heating up the target and doing these refinements. And by way, by, by way of doing this, okay, by, by way of, of uh, at each step, we are just uh, adding a, a small bit of info into our simulation, which ensures that the set of support where we do this, where we approximate this dynamic programming program is, is close enough to the idea. Okay. And this works really, this is really key to the success. Okay. So, um, um, all right. Now, uh, so that's the idea. So we really kind of iterate between annealing and uh, this backward recursion. And by, by this way, we can have an, an almost optimal uh, lighting estimate. Okay. Now, um, actually, in, in the manuscript that we are preparing, so we don't have a working paper yet, but it should be out in a couple of weeks. You can actually show that this annealing makes lots of sense, although theoretically. Um, so we have some, actually, we have some uh, theoretical results where uh, we can give some upper bounds on the so called forward KL distance. So what is this forward KL distance? Um, so this is the kind of KL distance where you take the expectation, you take the, the log difference between your target density which is the smoothing density and and what you would like to do to, and your approximation of it and you take the expectation with respect to, to a smoothing density and this is actually the right kind of care distance care diversions when you think about importance something which is really what what we have okay no this is not if you think about variation inference the kind of care distance that in computer science that variation inference would be uh, minimizing there you would be uh, switching the role of the Q of the important sampling distribution and the, and your target distribution. Okay, now that's easier to, to deal with, but that's not the right one that you would like to have for important sampling. Why? Because essentially, if you, I would be kind of switching the role of the two, then minimizing a care distance where I take the the expectation with respect to the important sampling distribution, that kind of minimizing problem may be putting too low. It, it can result in uh, densities which have two thin tails. Okay, so actually, what we can show here is that, that we, we can put upper bound on the right KL distance. Okay, so there are some nice theory results that we have been able to prove. So that's that's the inner core. Okay, and I think I'll let me go a bit faster on the outer core so that I can show you some, give you some more intuition on, 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 on one model. Um, so then, given that I, we have just to remember, just to like after we do all that, that's really a major part of the paper of our paper. What we're going to have is that, given the theta and the lambda, we have a very efficient estimate of the y of the, of the likelihood, and then we still need to estimate the likelihood. Uh, and again, we're going to be, be Bayesian there. Okay. So what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to define. We, we're going to be kind of defining a sequence of distribution of the joint space of the parameters and the states. Okay. And uh, the particular sequence that um, we are uh, deriving, so really what we're doing, we, we're going to approximate, we, we're going to use a so called sequential Monte Carlo sampler. So here the idea of sequential Monte Carlo samplers do is that. Um, if you, you, you create a, a sequence of bridges, bridging densities between the prior and the posterior density, where lambda again is a tempering a parameter, where lambda is equal to one here, there you would have the posterior. If lambda is equal to zero, then you have the prior. And then what you're going to do is that we're going to simulate particles, extended particles. So now we are actually not only simulating the states, but we are we are simulating joint particles, which include the states and the, the parameters through this sequence of distributions to arrive to the posterior, okay? So as lambda goes from zero to one, this SMC square bridges between the prior distribution to the desired posterior distribution. So this, uh, 
uh, this framework is called SMC square because essentially in the outer loop, we have a, an SMC algorithm over, over the joint space, over the extended particle space, which include the fixed parameters and the inner core within each step, you also have inside the particle filters, which allows us to move within. So it's really, you do sequential Monte Carlo within sequential Monte Carlo, okay? So this framework has been developed in previous work by us and some of some other people, Nicola, for instance, who is also part of our uh, proposal. And now it, it is getting more and more traction. It's, it's a very kind of powerful framework. Method. I have to say that essentially, if you want to link this to uh, Monte Carlo methods, really what you're doing in this sequential Monte Carlo samplers, you're essentially simulating thousands of MCMC chains, if you wish, through this bridge, through this density bridge. So it, it allows uh, it allows massive parallel computation. So it allows you to use uh, modern clusters and uh, or GPU cards. So it really uh, it's, it's really amenable to modern computation. I think I'm going to be skipping. So also in the SMC square part, actually we had to, so if we are just not taking uh, uh, existing SMC methods. We, th there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of innovations uh, that we did to this methodology to, uh, to fit, um, to fit uh, the problem here. Uh, but let me jump through this because I'm going to be running out of time. And I, I would like to show you some uh, figures. So the application, the specific application that uh, we're dealing with is a, <clears throat> is a standard uh, new Keynesian DSG model um, that is now essentially the workhorse model in macro, okay? So here the idea is a representative agent economy where you have a representative household, you have a final goods producing firm, you have intermediate goods producing firms and the monetary fiscal authority. I mean, with these new Keynesian DSG models, the idea here is that they allow they introduce rigidities uh, into, into the economy uh, such that <laughs> monetary policy can have real effects. And essentially that's the model that is different version of these such models are, are being used in central banks now uh, for policy analysis. So really after you uh, write down the model, you have a set of uh, equilibrium conditions um, that assuming rational expectations, you have a set of state variable S. Um, and, uh, and here, uh, what we do in our, in our, um, in, in our uh, simulation exercises, we're gonna be working with a second order perturbation solution. So we are not, we, again, we want to keep nonlinearity. On the other hand, we want to, you know, we want to have a relatively fast method, so we stay at second order accurate perturbation solution. Uh, we gonna be fitting, so we have seven state variables and three observables, uh, GDP, inflation, and the nominal interest rates. Uh, and for all, each of these three, essentially what we're having is that uh, we are allowing some measurement errors. Now, the literature so far, essentially, really, given that people, you know, the, the existing literature who are, so there are some people who have been estimating nonlinear macro models using particle filters, but given essentially that the proposals they were using were very inefficient, they were using the, essentially most of the literature is using the bootstrap filter, they have not been able, well, uh, they had to, uh, all the existing papers are essentially just, uh, just fixing the measurement errors on this set. What it means essentially is that even without looking at the data, they say a priori that what percentage of the observed time series is not explained by the model. Okay, it's a totally ad hoc assumption. And the reason why they do that assumption is that computation, they cannot estimate these models because really what's going on is that when these observations error decrease, then the informativeness of the observations on the later states increases and the bootstrap, the, the filters that they are using break down, okay? So what we can do is that we can actually check, we can actually free up these parameters, you know, because now we have a very efficient method and we can estimate these models no matter what uh, the observation errors are. And we can let the data tell us 
how we specify the model extreme cells. Okay. Okay. Again, we have we, we need to do some some further uh, model specific uh, tricks to to uh, to to make the model work. But but essentially, the point is that for these DRG models, we came up with some extra uh, extra tools to make this uh, usable. What I would like to stress out is that lots of the tricks that uh, we are using here are actually not specific to this model, but they are extendable to other DSG models. And here are the results. Okay, so let me explain you a bit. So what we have here is that we have we have we, have, we, we did two sets of simulation. First, we did a uh, simulation of a linear model. Why? Because in a linear model, we know the ground truth. Okay, in the in the linear model, the gamma filter is is the is the right filter. So we get the likelihood, and we can see how the state of the art, which the bootstrap filter and R method compares. Essentially what we see is that our method essentially works perfectly. And while, you know, the, the comma, uh, by the particle filter, in particular as you are going from, uh, you know, the measurement error tells you what percentage uh, the, is the level of observation noise uh, on the observable. So when this measurement error is small, it means that uh, the model based macro quantities are, are uh, tracking the observables more closely when this is large uh, is the reverse. Now, uh, yeah, so as you can see that our method essentially works everywhere and uh, the bootstrap filter breaks down, okay? Um, in particular here, you can see that the variance of the bootstrap filter, even when they use a very large number of uh, particles, it's huge, okay? So more or less the Fox theorem is that this variance of the likelihood estimate should be around one. And you can see this is hundreds of times more, okay? But essentially our method has almost no error, estimation error in the likelihood. And once we move, and this, this is just, just tells you the same story uh, in graphics, okay? So our method, estimates the likelihood perfectly while the bootstrap filter breaks down, okay? Now, most of the existing papers in macro are in this scheme, in this ME, when they are essentially using large measurement errors to make their exercise function, otherwise it breaks down. Now, once we move on to the nonlinear model, it's more or less the same story, okay? So, here, the common filter one is the wrong one. So, you know, the linearized, essentially what you can see here, here we don't know the ground truth, but if you do a linearization to it, obviously it, it, it's, a, it's a wrong model. So there is a, there's a penalty for that. So the common filter gives you a lower likelihood than uh, the exact filters. And again, we can see that our method gives essentially a perfect estimate of the likelihood while the bootstrap filters essentially are not practicable. Now, moving on to real data, and then I, I think I'll stop as uh, time is running out. So these are the three time series. So here, I mean, in, in, this, in, in this exercise, we stopped at 2007, given that in the model, you know, I was telling you that uh, the zero lower bound, so I said essentially the model, the, the model we took as an example to estimate uh, doesn't allow for zero lower bound in the interest rates. So we didn't want to use data to estimate this model uh, in the period after uh, the big financial crisis when this zero lower bound interest rate is an issue. So we have been using data between 2083 and 2000, 1983 and 2008 to estimate these models. And uh, the point I'm making, so here, here we, we compare two set of exercises. So first where we do what the existing literature does where they just ad hoc, in an ad hoc way uh, fix the measurement error of the observable and 20% of the observed variance of the three time series. Or second, when what you want to do, you want to let the data essentially tell you how much, you know, how much error is there in each time series. So I would like to point, point out three things on this graph. First, that the likelihood error, so that the, the, the likelihood uh, when we free up the measurement error is much larger than the likelihood Imagine likelihood in the in the state of the art estimation. This is really what the literature is doing. So really freeing up this parameter increases the likelihood a lot. 
second and the point estimates of the standard errors are very different. So, you know, this totally ad hoc assumption of just fixing this at 20% of the observed variance is indeed not valid. And second, that there are some of the structural parameters. There are some where it doesn't make a big difference, but there are some where it, you know, putting different weights in a sense on a different series does make a big difference. In particular, in the third column, the K, essentially the parameter K is a parameter defining uh, the extent of nominal rigidities in this model which is key, uh, you know, for monetary policy, nominal rigidity tells you what's the real effects of monetary policy. It's, it's, it's drastically different between. So essentially what we're doing here actually does have also economic implications. It's not just a statistical nicety that we can estimate freely some parameters, okay? So to conclude here, uh, again, uh, what we have, uh, what, what we have, uh, Done. Now we have actually a nonlinear tool set, if you wish. You know, like essentially now most of the literature in macro, they are using these low linearized models and common filtering techniques to estimate these uh, uh, these macro models uh, in a Bayesian setup. Now we believe we have a pretty generic tool set, but you can you, you essentially have a nonlinear tool set. So as long as you have a solution methods which is reasonably fast, okay. Uh, and reasonably approximate, we can kind of provide users uh, a tool set on how to actually estimate this without making ad hoc assumptions. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, so in the manuscript under preparation, we also have an appendix we, we have maybe show another application on a, on a standard long run risk model. And, uh, and we are preparing to, we would like to, you know, right, right now, one of the things that we are doing. Uh, within actually this uh, research uh, project uh, CY is that we're going to have a postdoc uh, joining us from September. We would like to, you know, it seems that it seems to us that one of the big blocks for these new methods is ease of use. So we would like to kind of prepare software tools for uh, Mac researchers to use these techniques. I mean, we believe these techniques are really, really useful. But if you want to entice people to use them, you have to make it relatively easy to use them. I think that's the, in my mind, that's one of the big things to, to do to, to make them easier to use essentially. Okay. So I think I'll stop here because I, I had one hour and uh, I'll take any questions that would come up. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Andras, uh, for this very nice uh, talk. Uh, we, we will have a, a round of questions, maybe before uh, opening the floor for questions, uh, I, can, I can jump in and, and start with one. Uh, so um, uh, 